Well, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say thank you for participating in this um, this webinar. Just to kind of give you a quick introduction. Um, my name is Ali Razai Klagi. I'm the uh, product manager for the material testing side in in Prosec. Today, I'm joined by uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Andre Naf, uh, which is uh, head of our global marketing, and uh, Serena Drongs, which um, is our online marketing specialist. Uh, my colleagues will be working very hard in the background, although you won't be able to see them, to make sure this session will go smoothly and deal with any uh, technical requirements that we may have during the webinar. Uh, once again, if you experience any difficulties with the, so the sound or, or the pictures, please uh, send a message to uh, Prosec SA, um, which is uh, clearly uh, shown as host, and we should be able to help you. Same thing applies to the, um, to the question. So on that note, uh, let's begin our, our webinar. Um, we're pretty much going to follow the schedule that we sent you and uh, deal with each topic as we go along. First thing, I'd like to kind of give you some, some background and overview about our uh, latest platform, Equity 550. I've got it right here with me as well, with some test blocks and a uh, few of our impact devices and indenters with it. As uh, uh, a lot of you guys might uh, probably aware, we uh, started with equity platform 1975 and as years have passed by we have introduced new uh, devices which each one has uh, had additional advantages and features on top of the other ones and in 2015 we were very pleased uh, to announce the release of our latest equity platform uh, equity 550 um, Equity 550 as a whole, we would like to call it like um, almost like an all-in-one uh, hardness testing solution because you could be able to accommodate several different uh, methods or principle, portable hardness principle, under one umbrella in the same basket. During today's presentation, uh, in particular, we're going to highlight how you can use, utilize these um, different uh, principle, portable principles together to overcome some difficult uh, uh, geometries and uh, some applications that in the past perhaps we were not be uh, we haven't been able to uh, address for you. Our goal with Equity 550 again today, what uh, what you'll find and you'll see as we go into some more technical side of the presentation is to uh, be able to cover uh, a wide variety of application within the uh, large uh, industrial sectors, whether if it's oil and gas, uh, automotive, um, aerospace, general manufacturing. So with Equity 550, you'll be able to kind of uh, choose the appropriate, pro appropriate device to suit your application. And each recommendation that we make, even within our interactive wizards and um, uh, guidelines and the specification that we have within the device, uh, we also make references to international standards and guidelines for you. And for example, uh, at our verification wizard, you be able to choose what standard you would like to comply to when you verify your instruments. You can even uh, decide to have your own custom uh, parameters uh, when you when you verify your instrument, and that information is then stored, and you can generate a report alongside with your results and provide that to your client. Um, moving on, uh, as I said, um, Equity 550 has this sort of interaction with with the client and with yourself as you do the testing. So even if you're not 100 percent sure uh, which application is suited with what test principle, the device uh, will ask you a series of questions. And we have created an algorithm which, based on that, it will make the correct recommendation. On top of that, as I explained earlier, a device automatically verifies itself. So all you have to do is just follow the simple instruction on the, on the screen. 
Uh, again, we're kind of going to just touch on the surface with the, the features of Equity 550 because we really want to get into the applications that we, we will be uh, highlighting today. But I thought it's important to touch on these two uh, features of Equity 550 and later on we will actually physically go through the combination results. But the importance of verification mean, means that uh, as you got that assurance yourself and your clients that the results and the data that you gathered and you pass it on are accurate and done with an instrument that's been verified. And as you generate reports again, whether you go directly via device or use our Equitive Link software, uh, you'll be able to uh, attach the verification data to your, to your results as well. With Equitive 550, uh, while we're on that topic, um, we discovered during the development stages that um, a lot of uh, applications, they require different type of information during the measurement. And uh, for that reason, we decided to have uh, multiple screens, multiple views. Later on, as we kind of went uh, through the process of developing it, we uh, came up with this idea of what if we can actually show three uh, simultaneous display, three individual type of information for the client or for the for the for the user as as is doing the measurement. But on the other side, if you decide, uh, we got this um, middle button uh, that we call it, and uh, with that you can toggle uh, full screen for any type of the uh, um, any of the screens that you wish to display uh, as well and moving them around. And one of my favorite ones generally when I'm doing a testing, I usually know exactly what type of information I like to see. So uh, we've got this um, uh, custom users view which you define what information you would like to see per each window. And it just makes the workflow much, much smoother as you're doing the testing. On the other side, you can just go with a nice and simple way of uh, just having two uh, or three columns and have your uh, values. Uh, the other thing that's yeah. quite unique to Equitip 550 is that it will display two scales simultaneously. So you can have a native scale, i.e. leap D, and, and your Vickers or any other type of hardness scale that you want. Bear in mind that uh, conversions in, uh, in Equity 550 obviously automatic. The older conversion uh, uh, correlations and conversion tables are already inside the device. And uh, lastly, um, as before, your Equity 550 comes with uh, fully functioning uh, software, which allows you to extract the data, analyze it, edit it, and uh, put it on your own header and send it to your, uh, to your clients as you report your, your results. Um, that was almost like a very brief introduction of the device because we are going to be working with this today. Not only looking at its functionality, but uh, going to the combination wizard in particular. We've got some examples for you here and um, yeah, you will see it uh, as, as we go through the slides. Right, let's begin with a uh, LEAP principle, which I believe a lot of you guys are already familiar with and been using uh, for a fairly long time. Um, LEAP is also referred to as, as a dynamic hardness testing or hardness method. It's portable uh, and the way it works, it uh, calculates the hardness based on loss of energy when an indentation is made on the surface of the material. So an impact body is thrown at the surface, some of the energy is absorbed and some of the, uh, uh, therefore the rebound of this uh, indenter is, has less energy, lower velocity. These velocities are calculated uh, because of the, an induction voltage that's created as the impact body passes through, through a coil. I've actually got an animation for you which kind of displays it a little bit better. So as you can see over here, 
this is your impact body, which you guys are familiar with every once in a while. You send your device for service, you know, maybe every few years, and uh, you might have to replace them depending on how, how much you've been using them or the, the material they've been using or how hard they are. Again, we're going to cover that today and give you some good ideas of how you can um, expand the lifetime of your, of your devices. But what's actually going to happen is um, it grabs the impact body, and as it's thrown, it passes through these coils. And this is the magnet. So as the ma magnet passes through the coil, the inducting voltage, induction voltage is, is uh, created. Therefore, and obviously we know the induction voltage before and after. And based on that, or we'll know the velocity before and after, rebound velocity and the impact velocity. Obviously, rebound velocity is going to be less. And based on this simple formula, that will become our leap value. Every, the same principle applies to all leap devices. They only have different energy and obviously different velocities. That's why you have different leap value. That's why your leap G is different to your leap D. Because the impact body and the energy and the induction balls are going to be different. Again, later on we'll cover which, what type of application suits what impact device. And hopefully that will help you kind of make the correct decision during your applications as well. One of the things I really wanted to highlight um, during the LEAP principle was, was the conversion and, and the importance of it and how it's been utilized. Um, generally speaking, uh, most of the LEAP users, equitive users, they don't uh, necessarily use the native scale. Uh, with exceptions of uh, um, companies who do role testing. They actually report in lead D and lead E. But uh, you'll find uh, uh, a lot of uh, Ecotip users, they use Ecotip, but they actually set it up to give readings in different hardness scales, i.e. your Vickers, your Brunel, your Rockwell C, based on their application, really. Uh, one thing to highlight here is that there is no mathematical relationship between hardness scales. So how these conversions and correlations are created is based on real tests. So uh, imagine you, they have, we have created uh, loads of different test samples of the same material at different hardness levels. These then been tested in a lab environment, then with an equitive device, obviously the respected equitive impact device. And then uh, these curves are created for you and then buried and put inside the equitive device. So with the click of a button, you can get your automatic conversion. But what you have to understand and consider here, as, as you convert, there are additional uh, uncertainties that can add it uh, to it. And that applies not only to lead, but any other type of hardness testing as well. So if you go from Brunel to Vickers, exact same principle applies. And that's one of the things in bracket I really wanted to highlight. So as much as possible, if you don't need to report your hardness levels in other scales, it's better to stick to the, to the native scale. And that's why uh, role manufacturers, they adopted to report in leap D and leap E, uh, which is the native scale of, 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 of the instrument as they do the test. Um, moving on. Um, we're going to spend about five minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer actually, on, on the portable rock ball. And the reason I'm saying that because generally we get a lot of questions in this uh, kind of late, latest addition to our uh, Ecotip platform, platform, even though it's been around for a few years now, but it's still kind of fresh. However, it's uh, really kind of finding its feet within, within the industries, uh, especially in oil and gas, pipe manufacturers, water treatment. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. Um, Ecostat, as, as um, some of us know it, now we refer to as portable rock wall on the Arctic 550 platform, is based on true indentation. And that principle is the same as your static traditional methods. You know, so you're looking at plastic deformation as we do the testing. In Ecostat, in, in portable rock wall, um, case, we're actually looking at the depth of penetration. So it's com almost closely linked to the static uh, methods that we, we are accustomed to for, for years and years. 
The other advantages of portable rock wall is that because it's based on indentation, and these indentations are really shallow in few microns in many cases, you know, 5, 10, 15 microns depending on the hardness, um, the geometries of, for example, let me be more straight to the point, the thickness of the sample is no longer a problem. As you can see right next to me, the test block, uh, reference test block uh, for verification of portable rock wall is much smaller, much thinner than a leap uh, reference test block because we don't have a vibration problem anymore. On the other side, this device becomes much less material dependent. And if you look at our Exit 550, you'll find that portable rock wall has a default conversion. And you don't necessarily have to select the material unless you're dealing with something very exotic. Uh, and in them cases, we have done some case studies and we found, for example, uh, titanium, uh, aluminium, and stainless steel have almost, and nickel alloys actually, have very little differences to, uh, to standard curve that we already created. So that's a very good news. On the other side, portable rock wall uh, could be used to verify other portable principles and the static uh, lab-based uh, testers, hardness testers. Uh, on top of that, and again, we're going to cover that this during this presentation. Um, your uh, portable rock wall device could be used to correlate new conversions and allows you to kind of really uh, deal with some difficult applications. We're going to show, show one good example for a heat affected zone and weld inspection today. Well, we had that topic. I just wanted to show you some animations to see how, while well, we had the lead one, I thought, let's look at portable rock wall as well. What's actually happened is very similar to your uh, rock wall C principle. Obviously, loads are different. However, the principle is, is very similar. It is a 20% preload and 80% uh, of total load. So 10 newtons and 50 newtons. And what we're actually looking at is the differential uh, depth different uh, dif differential depth between the uh, preload of 10 newtons and total load of 50 newtons. So as we apply uh, the total load, we then remove it back to the preload stage of 10 newtons. And what that actually allows is that the elasticity, uh, that again, uh, almost like elasticity is probably one of the biggest issues when it comes to hardness testing. And the beauty of this test principle is by removing the load and uh, measuring the depth then, uh, you are pretty much just dealing with the plastic deformation. And that's again links it to the traditional method. You're looking at final uh, indentation in a way. Just to emphasize that, and like, so we all on the same page here, I want to show you another graph. So as we apply the force, this is our preload over here, and then we apply another 40 newtons, and that's our total load. We remove the 40 newtons, which is our total load, and then this area down here is our elastic moment. And this is our plastic deformation, and that's why we measure the depth. That's where we measure the depth. Uh, also in the bracket, the Preloader stage allows us to kind of deal with some of the surface discrepancies to a degree as well. And that's why um, when you say a portable rock wall, even though the indentation is far shallower than, than a lead device, for example, the surface roughness is almost similar. And you still get a steady, stable, repeatable result at that stage. Now, if you're dealing with a harder material, it's very simple. Uh, our depth of penetration is shallower, our plastic deformation is smaller. Uh, so our indentation basically is smaller. And as simple as that, uh, it's basically standard uh, static principle that's uh, been around for, for, for years. Um, one of the important aspects of portable rock wall is um, the fact that um, the indentation, like I said, is very, very shallow. And um, one thing I want to kind of highlight here is, let's pick an example of 40, 45 Rockwell C sample, which is in the mid-range hardness, a little bit on the high, 
harder side. We, we will be penetrating around 15 microns. Uh, the static uh, principle, they say that sample thickness, the minimum sample thickness, has to be 10 times uh, the indentation depth. So if you're going in for 15 microns, we only need 150 microns for our thickness. And now, if we start thinking outside the box a little bit, we can actually see that there isn't many instruments, portable instruments, that allow us to do testing on geometries that thin. So another big advantage of portable rock ball is that you can actually use it on samples that are really, really thin. So in this case, even if sample is 150 microns, you can still test it as long as it's, you know, within the tolerances. So I would say anything up to, you know, 30, uh, uh, 300, 400 microns, you would, you would never have problems with portable rock wall. One thing I also wanted to do is um, now that we hopefully are all on the sort of same page as far as uh, how, what is the principle of portable rock wall. I wanted to also uh, show you some good clear comparisons uh, of indentation diameter. If I was to go with indentation depth, there, you would actually, the portable rock would be far in favor because at 55 rock wall C, you only kind of penetrate in around 11 microns, for example. But what we decided to do um, to show you the diameter of indentation and then compare compare it to each other. And when you look at uh, this chart, I've picked uh, Vickers and, uh, and UCI. UCI is 15 years and UCI uses the Vickers indenter. You're looking at about 124 um, microns. Uh, but with portable rock ball, you're looking at 60. Generally, when you're doing a test, it's, it's one of them things that you want to make the uh, least amount of indentation with the most amount of force. And that's pretty much when you can think, oh, okay, my, my results are a little bit more on the accurate side. And even though that we are applying 50 newtons of force, our uh, diameter of indentation is less than half of, of the closest um, device to it. Now, hopefully these uh, initial sort of sections of, 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 of our webinar has enabled you guys to kind of engage a little bit more with, with the sort of a principle of, of these, these two uh, methods and how it actually works. One thing I'd like to do in, in, in during this uh, portion of the presentations, um, again, I'm going to pick an application and then we're going to break it down here how we can actually qualify uh, a particular test principle based on the hardness that we're dealing with, uh, geometries of our samples, and um, uh, basically the, uh, uh, the conditions that, that, they, that we're dealing with. And based on that, we qualify the appropriate test principle, something that will give us results right at the beginning and then we can kind of uh, um, uh, we can expect that repeatability as we progress day day in day out you know weeks after weeks months after months and you know years after years uh, as we do the test with that uh, particular instrument. The application I decided to choose here was inspection of rolls. Um, a lot of you guys are probably uh, familiar with these rolls are going to pass through uh, rollers uh, at temperatures kind of below the uh, recrystallization. And um, as they go, the thickness is kind of decreased. Um, as the thickness obviously decreases, the hardness increases. Uh, and they go through, they require grinding um, to bring them back to the original sort of state because if if they don't uh, spouse form, then that reduces the lifetime of these rolls significantly. However, it's very important. Uh, so that's why the hardness testing is done before and after. However, it's very important to choose the correct uh, method to test these um, rolls because they're really hard. Some of them you could be looking 65, 68 rock roll C. And if you choose a uh, an instrument or, or, or an indenter uh, that is not designed for that level of hardness, you may start to see 
uh, deviation in your result as you progress through the, through the days, weeks, or months. And again, you really don't want that. That's why the verification of the instrument is recommended. But you don't really want to be uh, replacing uh, parts or, for example, indenters just based on the fact that you didn't choose the right indenter for the right job. With leap devices, we, we talked about them earlier, how they work, how the impact body is propelled against the surface. And today I'd like to kind of, uh, I'm not going to cover all of them, but I'm going to concentrate on three main probes uh, to break down for you. And in this section, we're going to highlight the S device and the E device, because this is re relevant to this application. Um, S device has an indenter that's made out of uh, ceramic. An E device has diamond indenter. Diamond is probably the hardest material known to man. Uh, the D device is a general indenter uh, for um, corrective leap. It probably suits 90-95% of the application in, in many cases, but it's designed for hardness levels up to about 50, maybe 55 or 40. Anything above sort of 50, 55, you should be really looking for either S or, or an E because the tungsten uh, indenter of the D device will wear out uh, significantly quick on uh, uh, hardness levels above 50, 55. And uh, this is where you start to see the deviation. So uh, sometimes you really have to draw the line and start kind of um, researching and making sure that you choose the right probe for the right job. What we actually did at ProSec, we started to notice that um, customers are, some of them, some of the sort of newer ones, that they made certain uh, cases where we uh, really had to kind of look deeper into it. So what we did, we took the, took the decision to go ahead and do, so do a case study. And during this case study, uh, my colleagues in uh, our Switzerland office set up a, a CNC machine and created the same condition for several different impact devices, D device, G device, S device, so on and so forth. And uh, what we did, we carried out testing on uh, uh, with these devices. To our surprise, um, the devices still perform really well at 56 uh, rock wall C. And by the way, even though the tolerances, uh, for example, for ASTM standard is plus or minus 6 um, uh, for, uh, for, for uh, verification, we actually go with much tighter uh, levels. We actually go plus or minus four. And that was the case in this uh, case study as well. And um, we noticed that even at 56 rock wall C, the device performs really well. But as soon as we went above, you know, the, I was referring to these rolls of 60, 65 and above, as soon as we started to kind of go above 60 rock wall C, we could see a significant difference. Uh, but again, to our surprise, S device would help the hardness really well. We managed to get 143,000 and more impacts out of it. And that's where we really stopped the test and said there's no point carrying on because it was, wasn't was really changing. Um, and based on that, we can actually say that E-Device would perform even better than S-Device uh, because um, E-Device has got an in, uh, diamond indenter. The reason I'm saying this is that obviously E-Device is, is the tool that should be utilized for such levels of hardness testing. However, we know that there's a price tag attached to it, and because of the diamond inventor, it could be significantly more expensive than the S device. But nothing is stopping you to utilize an S device, which uh, is actually not that far off from the D device on the price tag side, I think, perhaps. But it will give you that repeatability and reliability that you expect. So again, by understanding how each probe is made and what is its purpose, you be in a place to make a correct decision and qualify your, your instrument correctly before you start doing the test. So again, uh, hopefully after this presentation, for those of you guys that deal with that level of hardness, you've got additional sort of a, uh, you know, tool 
in your in your arsenal to tackle such such issues. Um, one of the things that again I want to um, highlight here is the importance of of surface condition. These are I mean now still we're going to uh, the factors that affect our our harnesses and how we should qualify uh, our instruments. Uh, surface condition is, is the key, not only for portable devices, not only for uh, portable rock wall, LEAP, UCI, but any type of hardness testing. And generally speaking, if the penetration uh, uh, depth is, is, is fairly shallow, uh, then the surface roughness becomes even more important. And during the surface preparation, we need to make sure that we avoid uh, cold work and uh, hot heat, heat work because uh, hardness testing is a surface test. So as we do the surface preparation, we should try to avoid uh, affecting the condition of our, of, of our surface. Ecotip 550, every single unit that you, uh, you get it now comes automatically with a surface roughness comparison comparative plate. And that coupled up with the measurement result that's um, programmed into the device, you'll be able to really uh, identify what surface condition suits what application, so on and so forth. So if you give the certain geometries to your Ecotip 550, and then it qualifies a particular test method for you, i.e. Leap D or Portable Ruffle, and based on that, it also makes the correct recommendation for surface conditions. So it will tell you you need 2 microns, 1.6 micrometers average roughness. So you would just basically prepare your surface but by touching your roughness comparative plate and your surface condition. You can easily compare them to each other and that would you would know exactly where you're standing. And again, these values that you see over there are average uh, surface uh, roughness which is minimum and maximum is, is different. So the values you get with the result in the device and in your comparative place are RA, which is, which is the average roughness um, for, your, for your surface. Now, we've covered pretty much a lot of the factors that affect uh, how we select uh, test principle. Now, in order to understand it even more, I, I, I wanted to break it down. I've got some examples here. These are actually two pipes to, uh, because we're dealing with duplex steel and uh, as some of you are aware, there is no conversion for duplex steel for LEAP. So, as we're dealing with uh, non-ideal samples, and uh, the reason I'm putting NORTES and ASME report out that these two reports are uh, great because they directly address non-ideal samples and what are the uh, factors that affect in that. Um, based on that, shape, mass, thickness, surface condition, and homogeneity. These are things that we need to five things that we need to pay attention to. Looking at these bullet points here, uh, it's very simple. I can't do anything about the shape of these samples, can't change the shape. Uh, I can't make them any heavier or lighter, that's what they are. I can't do anything with the thickness. I can, we know now we, we can do surface preparation and do that correctly, so we can d take care of that, so that's not an issue. And again, we can't do anything about the homogeneity, so based on that, we need to know if we want to use a leap device, where a leap device, for example, leap D, you need to have 25 millimeters for thickness and five kilogram of mass, um, give or take. And unless the conversions that you want to use in in Ecotip wouldn't will not work. Now, nothing is stop. Although these conversions there, but nothing is stopping us to making a custom correlation based on real values. So what we actually did, because we knew that the samples that are going to be tested on site have exact same diameter, same thickness. So we send these samples to lab and they were tested. And when they came back, we did a one point shift of uh, the closest curve to, uh, to duplex steel, which is obviously stainless. 
And uh, I've just created a little example for you here to see how this happened. With the Codify Play, again, you can, with a click of a button, you can create these, and they can go back in there and edit them as well if needs be. Sometimes you might have more than one sample. You want to have two samples, you have a broader range. So you can just use a two-point shift and accommodate that broader range. On the other side, my recommendation for such exotic material is that always do your own polynomial curve, perhaps get five to ten samples at uh, various different hardness levels covering the range that you're dealing with and create your polynomial curve. Again, that's, that's, that's probably the uh, most accurate and uh, effective way of, of, of doing your curve. However, so when you're dealing, the re what, what I'm trying to say here, as you deal with these exotic material at different uh, geometries, uh, as long as you can consider these uh, discrepancies, you can compensate for them and overcome the problem. And from here, I will be able to use my uh, leap device, leap D device, or leap DL device, and test these pipes on the side and wouldn't have a problem. Um, and this also became so the sort of a fun foundation of the combination wizard that uh, we created to overcome uh, applications like uh, dealing with heat affected zone and weld inspection, uh, which again is it's our next topic of, of discussion. Again, for here, um, I have picked an example, application example, of inspection of weld and heat affected zone. What's actually um, happening during the welding process, it's, it's, it's a heat treatment in a way. There, there are uh, components, all the components are exposed to heat. And as they're exposed to heat, they become harder, especially steel. Uh, that's what's that, that's exactly what's what's what happens as, as you heat steel. Not all material, but steel, for example, is one that as you expose it to heat, it gets harder. And as it gets harder, it gets brittle. So it's very important to verify the status of the of 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 the heat affected zone and weld and the base material and to make sure that it's within the tolerances, because. If you don't do that, it could lead to failure. But one thing to consider here, we already covered, if you want to test our pipes that have geometries that less than 25 millimeters don't fit our leap device, we cannot use our leap device outside the box. We have to make the appropriate cor correlations before we can tackle the issue. So what we're going to do here we're going to combine. We already covered that with portable rock wall, there is no geometrical difficulties. So we can actually go into the base material and test and get accurate results. And we all know now that we can deal with non-ideal samples with our leap device and overcome that by making a new correlation. So combining two methods together would really allow us to to kind of overcome this uh, this application and deal with it in a very effective manner. Now, I want to kind of show you guys exactly what's happening during a weld failure. So we covered that. Welding causes heat treatment. Heat treatment causes hardening process. It leads to brittleness, potentially. As the pipe gets, uh, pipeline gets pressurized, you could uh, get a uh, crack and that would lead to failure. In fact, it's very common to see the weld in complete great nick. Nothing wrong with it. But the heat affected zone of, of, of the pipe is actually cracked. So that will have a significant uh, impact on the insurance cost for, net for as, 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 as your production kind of is affected, you will have downtime, and you will obviously have is uh, issues with uh, compliance to the directives and the standards that you should do. So basically, every time you do uh, such work, welding, you need to kind of do the testing uh, properly and accurately. You will have health and safety issues, and now obviously the environmental uh, issues that, that you will have with it as well. So by avoiding that, you will have much more benefits 
uh, as far as the sort of environmental side of things uh, are concerned. I mean, we all know what happened in, 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 in Gulf of Mexico and quite recently some, some oil pipes were, were, were leaked as well. And generally when you start looking at these things, um, not all of them are, are due to corrosion. Lots of them are due to uh, uh, wealth flows and such, uh, such applications, such issues. Um, one other important uh, principle that uh, I thought I should really cover here is the UCI principle. UCI principle is also, as I travel around the globe, a, a lot of uh, inspectors refer to it as ultrasonic uh, hardness testing. Um, in fact, it's uh, based on um, a rigid indenter that's attached to a resonating rod. So what UCI actually does, uh, the principle is that as you penetrate into the material, it looks at the frequency shift uh, due to the hardness of the material and elasticity, modular elasticity of the material. These two affect it. And based on this frequency shift, you get a hardness trend or change of hardness. If you're in a position to calibrate and correlate your device to exact same material with a known hardness, then you'll be able to also get a, a good idea about the hardness of sample that's being tested as well. So in a way, it's kind of a comparator. You're comparing Apple to Apple with, uh, with UCI. But UCI is very effective and very quick. So if you're in a position and already have an OCI um, device instrument in your, in your disposal, by using it, you'll be able to get a very good idea about the hardness trend and change of hardness, and you will be able to pin, pinpoint the problematic areas. And later on, by uh, correlating this, and again, uh, using the conversions, creating your own correlation, you'll be able to get in there with the combined method and get, get better accurate result out of it and find out exactly what the hardness levels are. In here, what I decided to do, we already covered the conversion side at earlier slide, but I wanted to emphasize that again, that conversions are created based on real samples. They are correlations. They are tests that have been done with a certain with a set, uh, samples with a certain mass and geometries. So nothing stopping us because there's no correlation between the uh, relation, mathematical relationship between them. So nothing will stop us to create our own correlations and conversions to compensate for the lack of mass, thickness, so on and so forth, as we already talked about. So for that reason, what we can actually do, we can correlate our LEAP device or our UCI device to our static hardness of portable rock wall. And we all know because of Portable rock wall by itself, uh, because of the way instrument is designed, uh, and, and um, you can see on, on the picture over here as well, you won't be able to get into the actual weld crown and the heat affected zone. Uh, however, nothing is stopping you to kind of get into the base material and make a correlation, similar to the duplex samples that I have there. Very simple step in ECOSIP 550, and you have got your correlation there. What I will potentially, uh, what I will actually do for you over here, and I will show it on the screen, um, is to combine these things and deal with uh, the little sample over here, which is obviously an, is classified as a non ideal This test block over here, this reference block, is uh, non-ideal for repetitive device because it's not 25 millimeters thick, and it's not um, it's uh, it's not five kilogram. So first thing. All I have to do is just go to my combined wizard over here and choose a certain parameter. So let's say we want to be in Rockfall C, for example, here. Next thing, you can choose your um, a conversions standard that you want to comply to. And then the device asks you to connect your probe and you're ready to do your impact. So in this case, it's asking me to make some impact with my lead device 
on my sample. And as you can see, my results are still fairly consistent, but at the same time consistently out as well, because I know for a fact that the test block is actually 61 Rockwell feet. So I'm going to accept that and go to the next screen. And now it's going to ask me to make some impact on the same sample, non-ideal sample, indentation with my portable rock wall. And then that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Right. I'm going to accept that three indentation is up. And now it's telling me that it has made a shift with H rock wall C. And it's going to plot the curve for me. And save it. And right there from the drop down menu, I can go into my measurement screen and choose the combined curve that I've created. Go back here. And if I go ahead now and do some impact on my non ideal sample, I should set my secondary scale to rock wall C get 61, 62 rock wall C that I expected. However, if we go back and choose the original conversion, you can see it shows 54 rock wall C. Same thing applies to your Vickers, Brunel, so on and so forth. So what we've done here, I mean, I can carry on doing tests on, on this and um, change it to my combined method. And as you can see, I'm consistently getting the result that I expect. This, this block is actually, uh, if I put this in uh, user's view, for example, my average value, um, I can go ahead and change my primary scale to right for C. You notice that uh, my average value is 62, and this test block is 62 right for C. 61.6 plus or minus 2. So I'm way within tolerance. Uh, of, of, the, of what I've expected. And you can see my result is fairly consistent. Uh, they're actually 61.8. I'll kind of even tailor it a little bit. As quick as that, the whole process probably took me maybe a minute, uh, maybe a minute and a half, but because I had to also connect my device to the laptop so you guys could see it on, on, the, on the other side. Now, Let's go back to our presentation here and try to kind of um, draw some conclusion now. Um, and hopefully we've, we've triggered some, some, some new ideas that you guys can now go and utilize. And uh, I've given you some, some uh, recommendations that should, should hopefully help you overcome the difficulties that you, uh, you're dealing with. So, Failure can can happen in any shape or form, and th that will definitely affect your productivity and profitability. So it's very very important for you guys to qualify uh, the right instrument for the right job. Uh, no doubt that will have a positive impact on your uh, productivity and non-destructive. Testing, we all know, is quick, easy. As long as we follow the rules, follow the specification, we get the repeated result that we want. So the important thing, again, is to make sure that we select the right suitable method for the job that we want it to deal with. And we will come to places where we have problems with geometries, thickness, you know, difficult areas to reach. So this is the areas when we kind of think outside the box and use all the tools available to us. So in this case, if I'm dealing with a pipe, for example, like you saw in the picture over there, weld, heat affected zone, non-ideal sample, I will combine them together, create my own curve. And Exit 550 actually gives you all the tools automatically. So it's just with the tip of a finger, click of a button, you can actually do it. And lastly, all the national and international standards Guidelines are out there, your no test report, your ASME, your ASDM standard, you guys are in US, in standard in Germany, 
Now the ISO standard is, is due to be published for LEAP. So these are all there for you guys to utilize and use it. The device, again, all of our wizards make recommendation to these standards for you. So again, if you need to verify your, stand, your device with, uh, in, in compliance with a particular guideline or standard, again, it's there for you. Click of a button. You can do it. And um, on that note, that's, we'll come to the end of this, this webinar. Um, I would like to thank you for joining us here, uh, and hopefully we could share some, some useful information with you today. We will carry on doing such webinars. Um, and we will keep you guys informed again. We go straight to the point, application-related technical webinars, addressing your applications, hopefully. Please get in touch with us again um, via uh, our e emails uh, that you've received, uh, the, uh, the information, and, you know, recommend to us what application you want us to cover. Now, um, I can see some questions already coming, and... Um, what I'd like to ask you to do, uh, please, um, if you've got a question, you can either use the chat box to send it to us. Some of you guys already have, or you can just unmute your um, your, your sound and uh, fire away and ask your questions. Okay, I'm going to ask my colleagues in uh, Switzerland to send me a question or read one out to me. Yeah, uh, Oli, we received the first question. Um, when you create a correlation curve, how many points do you recommend are two enough? Okay. Uh, I believe uh, you are referring to a polynomial curve. Um, if that is the case, generally anything between, I would say, four to five up to ten is, is good. If you're doing a polynomial curve, obviously the more uh, points you have, it's better. On the other side, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. You may also be asking for like if you're making a curve and shifting the curve, how many impacts we should take to take the average of that. If that is your question, uh, it's anything between three to ten impacts should be should be efficient to take the average of that. Okay. Yes, that that was. Uh, the question. Okay, so three to ten impacts and take the average of that and that will become one point. In this case I just did three for the, for the sake of presentation. Okay, any anyone else? You can, like I said, you're more than welcome to just unmute your, your sound and ask question. Okay, Ali, I'm just wondering if um, the presentation is available for download for reference. Uh, presentation uh, will be put on the web uh, on our uh, YouTube uh, channel uh, shortly, and uh, you should be able to uh, go back, watch it, review it, um, and if you need any particular documentation. Uh, please contact us at webinar at prosec.com and we will be able to send it to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. Okay, I, I do have another question. Sure. Um, so, uh, we have the system, uh, we just sent it out for calibration, so I don't have it with me yet, but I think the uh, system is from the 2007 vintage, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you were showing the uh, portable Rockwell probe uh, and the, um, you know, and the lead probe. Um, are they available for, um, for the older systems as well, or is this a new, uh, a new upgrade for the new system? Uh, I believe you have Equitip 3, the, the, the first generation, the yellow and gray box. Uh, please confirm if, if that's the one you've got. Uh, I think our box is gray, is gray and green. Gray and green. Okay, you got Equitip 3. Yes, uh, portable rock ball is compatible. Uh, so all you need is, 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 is the probe. But you don't have the wizards in Equitip 3. So you will have to do things manually. 
the, the beauty of Active 550 is that the combination wizards and everything else is already done for you. So it's more flawless. What I suggest is talk to our, our colleagues in USA and perhaps I'm sure they will be able to organize a trial for you or, or a demonstration. Excellent. Thanks a lot. No problem. Ali, we have been asked if there is some uh, first customer feedback, some uh, success stories we can share on the Equity 550 or combined method. Absolutely. I mean, um, as, as, as you can imagine, uh, some, some customers have uh, th their own restriction as far as what they can share and what they cannot. But what we actually uh, gathered uh, close to uh, launch of Equity 550 is, uh, was some um, testimonials. And some of these customers were actually utilizing the, the combined method. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight here for combined method is mainly used in, in the oil and gas sector. And uh, last time I was in the Middle East, um, there was plenty of customers using it over there. It's something that I can probably ask them and get, get some testimonials. I'm sure we can. Very good. Thanks. No problem. Okay, do we have uh, anyone else ask, want to ask a question or perhaps share some, um, let's say, um, some more, some application sort of uh, stuff for us? Yeah, we have uh, another question. Will the new UCI probe be used in the combined turf method as well? Absolutely. This is the whole point. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to utilize a combined method to correlate both UCI and LEAP to the portable rock for uh, true indentation hardness. And um, that will make a very, very unique device. And the platform is already uh, capable of doing that, believe it or not. So it's just a matter of connecting your UCI device to the platform and you're ready to go. So everything is pretty much there. So if you already invested in your Equity 550, um, you just connect your UCI probe when it's out and uh, you're all set. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay, on that note, uh, I believe uh, no more questions at the moment. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at this. So one thing I'd uh, like, one little request I have uh, from all the participants as well is that um, uh, we are working to make these webinars um, even better. You know, uh, we're working on. Uh, improving on them as much as we can, getting much more direct, straight to the point, covering, like I said, the applications that you have. Uh, so uh, my colleagues um, have prepared a, a little sort of a feedback form in it's an online format, just uh, four or five questions altogether. So um, you're going to receive that probably within a, a couple of days or so. If you could kindly give us some feedback and um, let us know what you think of, of the whole session today and what areas we could focus on a little bit more and what areas we could improve on, we would appreciate that and we will definitely kind of adopt that for our, our future webinars. Um, Ali, we have an additional question. Sure. Uh, we have two questions. To get the first, we can uh, cover, uh, can cover this. So, uh, it was, uh, we were asked when the UCI 
coming out. Now we have mentioned the UCI probe, right? And I, I think we can state, we cannot uh, state a specific date right now, but we can say that it will be soon. It will be this year, right? Yes, it's definitely going to be this year. Uh, we are in the process of doing some fine tunings. Uh, obviously, as, as we are project, we have certain sort of levels of standards that we always kept. So it's uh, we just want to make sure uh, that UCI, when it comes out, it's 110 percent uh, fit within our uh, platform because obviously our platform is solid. So we want to bring. And an addition probe to it that kind of fits the bill in a way. Right. Second question was um, uh, Bob noticed that uh, the portable, uh, the probe, portable rockle was used with a PC in one of the flights. Um, does this mean that the Equity 550 indicating a touchscreen device is not necessarily? Yeah, you, if you just want to, the, the, the beauty of the portable rock wall is that it will work either with an Ecotip 550 platform or directly into your laptop with the Ecotip link. And that's a very unique because it runs on a USB uh, USB port. Um, however, if you want to have your lead devices and obviously UCI devices, you will need your Ecotip 550 platform. But if you're in a position that you only need the portable rock wall probe, and uh, you don't need the Equity 550 platform, you can um, just get the probe and it does work directly with the PC. That's, that's correct. I have actually got another question here uh, direct to me about the UCI. So we've, we've covered the UCI, and um, I've had I have actually got a little um, feedback from uh, someone that I have a lot of respect for. <laughs> uh, Dr. Frank just uh, asked me to um, highlight the environment that the instrument is being used, and this is very important. Uh, the platform that Equity 550 actually utilizes now. This is. Uh, the platform that we used for our concrete um, uh, side of uh, 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 side of instruments for for a year, couple couple of years actually, and concrete testing is quite harsh environment and all that. So it, it almost like was trialed and tested in a way. So by the time we moved the platform to the metal side, uh, we already knew exactly what what can withstand. It's really tough. Uh, the screen, uh, even though it's touch screen, it's, it, it's again it is protected anyway, but it it can withstand quite a lot of harshness. It was IP tested as well, um, and uh, even like the way it's been put together, it, it, you, I don't think you would have problem with it as far as um, the type of environment you're testing. It, it is designed to be used on site. And it comes with all the tools and accessories to enable you to kind of carry it with you as well. Uh, so far, we didn't, we haven't really had any problem with the platform, and obviously we didn't have that with the concrete uh, side either. And that's something that uh, is probably important for a lot of you guys uh, as as far as the robustness of the instrument. Okay, so. Uh, when will the release of UCI? Uh, I've got another question about UCI. Like we covered the UCI, the UCI, we are in the process of finalizing things at the moment. So um, we carry on some additional testing, and again, should be before end of the year. Um, and as soon as uh, we are 100% happy, you guys will will obviously know as well. We will announce it. Okay, Andre, do you have any any more questions for me? Yeah, we have one more. Um, we were asked if the, there are any comments about or cautions on the temperature effect or on the test piece. Okay, this is actually a very good question. We did a little case study and um, we went all the way up to two hundred uh, degrees uh, centigrade. 
with with these uh, uh, with the test blocks and there was a slight difference in in the hardness but we couldn't really relate that because uh, it was linear in a way as well so and on the, on the, and then the other side you have to kind of really do a line and see like temperature how, what sort of conditions are you you talking about obviously temperatures that if you test it in a desert the temperature could up to go about 50 60 degrees centigrade I would say pr pretty much no but uh, if you're talking about a temperature of 600 degrees as the components are coming from the oven uh, heat treatment plant and they're still quite hot whether you can do the testing there and then that is definitely no so you do need to allow the, the components to kind of cool down to a reasonable temperature before you can carry on testing. But if you're just talking about the environment temperature, you know, 50, 60 degrees, that shouldn't be a problem for the test sample. I, I, please uh, confirm if this is the question and I've, I've answered it for you. That would be great. Yes, I think so. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Another question, Oli, from Joel. Um, how are the measurements affected by strong electromagnetic interferences? For example, arching furnaces used 20 meters away. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that we're talking about lead devices here. And electromagnetic fields do have an effect on the leap devices because obviously we covered it. How leap actually works is an induction voltage as uh, the magnet passed through the coil. So if we have electromagnetic fields nearby, that is absorbed by the coil and will have a uh, impact on the induction voltage that is uh, passed into the device. So, uh, and again, depending on the type of impact device that you use, the effect is going to change. Uh, if you use a G device, you're going to see more deviation and more problems than when you use like smaller impact devices. Uh, this will obviously be, this will obviously won't be an issue if you use portable rock ball because portable rock ball test principle is completely different and it hasn't got a coil or a magnet. Okay. Okay, no more questions here at the moment. Well, on that note, uh, I'm going to... So, one more from Peru. Okay, please. We've got a question coming from Peru. Starting the... So I got a question here. If I've got a metal plate uh, that is magnetized, can I use a leap device to test it? And the answer to that is no. You can't really test anything that has magnetic properties because that will affect uh, the coil and the impact body. Um, so yes. Should be avoided. If you have a magnetized metal plate, you should utilize portable rock wall to test it. No problem. <laughs> uh, Ali, just to clarify that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure. Are you saying that um, the material can't be magnetized or it just can't have magnetic properties? Uh, the, the question here was that if a material is, if the metal is, is a uh, ferrite metal is, is magnetized and uh, has magnetic properties. So in that case, that magnetic properties of 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 the uh, of the material will cause uh, will have an effect on the coil of the impact device. So that will affect your result if you use a leap device. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah, so, so are you saying then it can't be um, can't be used on carbon steel? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, if the carbon steel is magnetized, it's very unlikely for for, for it to be magnetized right. to that level to to have an impact. But if you actually have proper, you know, plate that is uh, magnetized for that reason, it's 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 going to have an effect on the coil of the impact device. So um, the the uh, so the voltage that is created as the impact body passes through. Will, will be varied, so that wouldn't be correct anymore. Okay, okay yeah, that, that clarifies it. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't saying that it had, just because it had magnetic properties. No, um, no, 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 no. Every it, every metal yeah. that has been tested with equity, I mean, majority of them are, are got, got magnetic properties. They're, they're ferrite metal. So, no, that's not a problem. But if it's magnetized, then uh, that will have an effect on... On, on the measurement, and that sh that shouldn't be done with leave anymore. Okay, thank you. No problem. Again, we uh, we're looking at um, I, from top of my head. Some 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 questions are coming uh, at the, the 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 amount of the force, magnetic force, and I have to be honest with you, I I I wouldn't be able to answer that. Uh, specifically exactly how much magnetic force is the limit uh, but uh, because it's very difficult to measure but we have done testing at different environments and it does have a significant effect uh, a lot of time it actually comes up with an error uh, and uh, if you notice some places you might even come up with no conversion sort of things and, and indicate errors for you okay Right, um, on that note, I'm going to ask my colleagues in Switzerland once again uh, whether we have any more questions or we can... Uh, no, no more questions. All right. Well, on that note, let's, uh, let's say thank you to everyone to, that joined us today. Uh, we were very excited about this webinar, believe it or not, and uh, we didn't know what to expect. But as it turns out to be, it was great. We, we had a great response, and that for sure would give us the energy and the enthusiasm to, to carry on doing such things for you. And please, like I said, keep in touch with us. Webinar at prosec.com. You can send your, uh, your feedback, you know, any particular application uh, that you would like us to cover in future webinars for you. And then hopefully we'll see you on the next uh, next webinar. And once again, thank you and uh, see you soon.